welcome to Nazarene Israel. I'm your host, Norman Willis, and let me tell you a story. A long time ago, in a land for most of us that's far, far away, in the Middle East, uh, in the days of the Exodus from Egypt, and later in the wilderness, there lived a Levite man named Aharon, or Aaron. Now, Shemot, or Exodus chapter 6 and verse 23, tells us that Aharon had four sons. Nadav, the firstborn, then Avihu, then Eliezer, and then Itamar. And one fine day in the wilderness of Sinai, Yahweh commanded his servant Moshe to consecrate Aharon and his four sons for the priestly service in the brand new Levitical tabernacle. Now, Vaikra, or Leviticus, chapter 8 and verse 33, tells us that Yahweh would consecrate them for seven days. Very interesting. That means for seven days, he would sanctify them and then also set them apart for his service. There's two parts. So what that means is, first, they would lay down their old lives in the world, just like Israel was supposed to do laying down their lives in Egypt. We're not supposed to want Egypt. We're not supposed to desire a return to Egypt or Babylon. Babylon is a smaller part of the greater Egyptian system. But our forefathers would lay down their old lives in the world and come out of Egypt. Well, they didn't do it. So now Yahweh's starting with the Levites. And the Levites now would lay down their old lives in the world. And now they would begin to live for Yahweh. That was the whole purpose, was to give the people a light, an example. Does any of this sound familiar? But, hey, You know, that was a long time ago in a a land that for many of us in the dispersion is far, far away, a different culture. So what does that mean to us today? Well, join us for Parashat Sav 2022 as we ask, what does it mean to be consecrated and set apart unto Yahweh today? What does this mean in the Melchizedekian order? And what does the consecration of the Levitical priesthood mean for us today who seek to be consecrated as the bridal nation of Yeshua HaMashiach? Brothers, sisters, if we want to be taken as Yeshua's faithful Proverbs 31 bride, then let's review what we know about the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony. While there are promises and exchanges of vows, both in modern Christianity and in modern Judaism, there are no exchanges of vows in Scripture. There's promises and agreements made, but there's no formal exchange of vows. In Scripture, it's implied. So in scripture for a wedding, they just follow the simple contract law. The two parties agree to marry, and there's some exchange of consideration today, such as a ring, but back in ancient times, even something like a shared meal to go along with the word. So for us in Israel, that shared meal is the Pesach or Passover. So Yahweh announced his intention to spring us from slave labor with Paro or Pharaoh and to take us as his bridal nation unto him forever. And the Pesach meal was the traditional Hebrew marriage meal, sealing the deal, so to speak. And if that wasn't enough, then the marriage would be publicly announced at Mount Sinai. And the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony has it that once the marriage is publicly announced, and there's a public exchange of vows, well, then the wedding is official, and all the rules and all the penalties apply. And as we come to an awareness of our Ephraimite identities today, we begin to realize that, yes, we are Ephraim. Let's also recognize that, yes, our forefathers committed many sins in the wilderness, even though our forefathers committed us in Shemot or Exodus chapter 19 and verse 8. And our forefathers promised that all, all that Yahweh had spoken, they, meaning us, would do. And then also in Shemot chapter 24 and verse 3, 
Our forefathers again said they would do everything that Yahweh had said. Are we, are we catching any idea of what our vow is all about? He's going to take us from nothing. He's going to train us to be his queen, his slave queen, but his queen. We just have to listen to what he tells us to do and do it. And also the things he said before that are written in the Torah, in scripture. That's it. It's, it's so simple. It doesn't take rocket. It doesn't take, we just have, it takes discipline is what it takes. It doesn't matter uh, anything else. It just, we have to want to be disciples. We have to want to learn what Yahweh is saying and obey. So then again, in Shemot chapter 24 and verse 7, again, our forefathers promised that they, meaning we, would do everything Yahweh had said, and that they, meaning we, would be obedient. (laughs) So what we see in all this is that marriage is an act of consecration. And in our case, we now effectively are consecrating ourselves, we're saving ourselves, setting ourselves apart for our husband. So as brides, now our job is to talk with the groom's best friend, which in Yeshua's case is the spirit. So we're supposed to be abiding in Yeshua 24-7, abiding in the vine, us in him and him in us, him in the Father and the Father in him. But mostly we're listening for Yeshua's spirit to tell us what to do, to find out what Yeshua likes. So we as good, faithful Hebrew brides can prepare ourselves so we know how to please our husband. We have to listen to his spirit and do what it says. We have to conform ourselves to whatever the spirit says. We have to become pleasing to him in every way so that when he returns, he's going to take delight in us. You know, how do you say these kinds of things? You try to wake people up to the the urgency of us being in the end times and the the urgency that Yahweh says only a small minority of us are going to make it. So, you know, we don't want to be like the majority of Ephraim, and it's tremendously sad, who don't obey, obey his instructions, and they effectively take their salvation for granted. You know, we don't want to be like most disciples who basically refuse discipline and walk a broad, easy road, doing whatever it is that they want. Mystery Babylon. We're pretending to be building part of Yahweh's kingdom. Really, we're serving Satan in his kingdom. It's a very simple choice. Are we going to give our allegiance and obedience to Yahweh and do everything he says like we would obey an earthly king? Or are we not going to do that and still expect rewards when we're not doing anything for those rewards? Well, this is important for us right now because on the Torah calendar, we expect to celebrate Yom Teruah, or the Day of Trumpets, on August 22nd of 2022. And as we saw in our studies on the ancient Hebrew wedding, Yom Teruah, or the Day of Trumpets, is the day that heralds Yeshua's return. And that's because in the ancient Hebrew marriage, after the marriage is arranged, first it's arranged at Pesach, then it's announced at Shavuot, and becomes legally or lawfully binding, then the groom goes back to his father's house to put on a mansion or a room, a room where his bride may live. In our case, there are many mansions in his father's house. But our, our groom has gone back to his father's house to arrange everything for the wedding. And then he comes back at Armageddon. So again, traditionally, in a, a regular marriage, the groom is going to add on a room to his father's house. And when everything's all said and done and all the preparations are made, the groom is going to send a messenger or a herald ahead of himself to announce that the groom will be coming that night, typically around midnight, at an hour we don't expect. Well, okay, so if we are wise virgins, then don't we need to have extra oil on hand? And don't we need to have extra wicks for our lamps so that we can be ready when our bridegroom comes? And perhaps he's even delayed, just like he says. But then according to tradition, the groom then comes for his bride on Yom Kippur. So that's when Yeshua is coming for us is Yom Kippur. And that's when Yeshua takes his bride back to his father's house. And the consummation and the wedding begin. And this 
dwelling together for the wedding week, that's what's symbolized by Sukkot or tabernacles. It symbolizes the wedding week, which is the ancient Hebrew honeymoon, and the new life together. So if you'd like to know more about the symbolism behind each feast, please check out our studies on the ancient Hebrew marriage and also the feasts of the first month, plus our studies on the feasts of the seventh month. All these can be found for free on the Nazarene Israel website. Well, most Ephraimites I know eagerly await the return of Yeshua HaMashiach. Some of us even dream of it. Some of us pray for that day. And it will indeed be an exceptional day. But uh, are we in Ephraim truly ready for him to come take us as his bride right now? When the Son of Man comes, will he find his consecrated bride faithfully saving herself and keeping herself pure for him and learning about what her husband likes? Will he find her truly preparing herself to become his faithful Proverbs 31 bride that he seeks? Well, next week in Parashah Shemini, we're going to read about what happened to two of Aharon's sons, Nadav and Avihu, who they were consecrated as priests, and yet they chose to disobey Elohim. We're going to see what happens to them. Spoiler alert, just like in the Garden of Eden, when, you diso- when we disobey Elohim's instructions, when we don't listen for his voice, do all he says, and obey whatever written commandments, because that's just his voice recorded before, and spoiler alert, it doesn't go well. So are we truly doing everything that he has said? Because that's the standard. So before we reach the story next week, uh, first let's consider what it means to be consecrated to Elohim. Let's understand what, it, what was this vow that they took. What was consecration all about? Well, for example, in Baikra or Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 30, we see that Moshe took some of the uh, cannabis cinnamon anointing oil and some of the blood which was on the altar, and he sprinkled it on Aharon and on his garments and on his four sons and on the garments of his four sons with him. And with that, he effectively consecrated Aharon to Yahweh. Consecrated his garments, his four sons, and the garments of his four sons with him. So now, let's look up this word consecrate in Strong's Hebrew Concordance to see what it's all about. So we see it's Strong's Hebrew number 6942, Kadash, which is called Dalet Shin. Well, we see that Kadash means to appoint or to consecrate, or to dedicate something. It's to keep, or to prepare, or to make something pure, and to sanctify it, and set it apart from the world and its defilements for a certain pure purpose. Well, and if it matters, Wikipedia's definition also reads the same. Consecration, in Wikipedia, means to have a solemn dedication to a special purpose or special service to be dedicated and to be devoted to whatever your cause is, be that your husband, be that some other cause. In other words, Yahweh wanted Moshe to set his brother Aharon and his sons apart, to make them special, so they could devote themselves to Yahweh for a specific purpose and for a specific service. And this is just like a bride, a righteous bride, will set herself apart for her husband to keep herself pure and do what she can to learn what he likes, and also she's a helper. She'll do what she can to help him. But if part of our marriage vow to our husband Yeshua is to consecrate ourselves and to set ourselves apart for him, then are we doing that really, truly, brothers? Are we truly setting ourselves apart for him as a nation? Because he calls us as a nation. And are we doing those things as a nation that he says he wants us to do? You know, you always hate to bring a message like this, but sometimes there's just some things that just have to get said. So I'm a sinner like anyone else. I don't, you know, I'm just reading scripture and realizing Yeshua has a structure and a framework. We better get busy and learn to plug ourselves all in to where we can help build his kingdom because he's just doing what his father sent him to do. 
So if we want to please him, we want to please his father in that day, don't we need to do the things that he says to do? Because he says all along from the beginning, listen to what I say and do it. That's it. It's not rocket science. It doesn't take, you know, PhD or whatever. You don't have to be any respect. Wherever Yahweh has us in life, whatever our station in life is, we, there's a, he has a role for us. We need to bloom where we are planted. We need to change the world through our interactions with the world. It's difficult. It's not easy. It's, it's a narrow and afflicted path. And all those who walk righteous in Messiah Yeshua will suffer pu- persecution. But, you know, this is just one of those things. I mean, I, I'm just, just like anyone else, but I'm looking at our brothers and sisters in Ephraim. And doesn't it kind of seem like maybe at least some of us in Ephraim today already think of ourselves as super brides? You know, like we're brides of the century or something you know even though we don't really do what elohim says you know isn't that kind of like saying we love yeshua with all of our hearts and with all of our soul and all of our strength and just saying words with our lips that's good enough we don't have to back that with anything we don't have to like realize that he has a structure and a framework for us to plug ourselves into and then he expects us to do it and if we don't do it we and our children will make it <laughs> you know, is there, is there anything in us perhaps left over from the church? I'm not saying, you know, that our forefathers came out of Egypt, but you had a hard time getting Egypt out of our forefathers, right? So I'm just saying we are coming out of mystery Babylon. We're coming out of the church. Is there perhaps just as a question, you know, since we're like our forefathers, is it perhaps possible even remotely that uh, there's something he has for us to do. We have to lay down our lives in Egypt. We have to lay down our lives in Babylon. We have to leave mystery Babylon completely and not yearn for those things. But then we have something to do and out of love and appreciation and thankfulness for all that he's done for us, we should want to build his kingdom together. But doesn't it seem like there's some of us that just don't really want to do that and yet we think it's already that we already are a super bride in his eyes because we know to rest on the Sabbath and feast. and We know to read the Torah portion. You know, let's just talk. I mean, the marriage with Yeshua, that is the ultimate set apart calling. There is nothing higher than that. There's nothing that's for what we were created. So we have good works to do that. We were created to do these good works. But doesn't it seem like some of us treat marriage with Yeshua more like a marriage of convenience? Just maybe a little bit like, ooh, so very exciting to be married to the king. But we don't really ever stop to sit down and count the cost of what it takes to be his queen. <laughs> you know, we're, we're very happy to call ourselves by Yeshua's name. Who wouldn't want to be the bride of the king of the universe? Hey, part of his father's house. Who wouldn't want to marry into the royalty above all royalty? And yes, sure, we kind of want or maybe even expect our Father Yahweh to take care of all of our earthly needs and give us nothing but blessings and never any challenges and this kind of a thing. And don't we sort of expect some of us still as maybe perhaps a leftover from the mystery Babylonian church, just maybe perhaps possibly, don't some of us kind of expect that Yahweh owes us a mansion and we're going to get to eternal life just because we know that we're supposed to be reading the Torah and we're not trying to do everything that it says. We're not trying to be like King David, the righteous King David who hastened to do everything Yahweh said. And we don't want to, we're not like the righteous King Yoshiyahu who when he heard the word the first time tore his clothes and wept and did everything in his power to clean up his own house. Are we, are we doing that, brothers, sisters? So are, are we in this for what we can do for our husband? Are we in this for how we can help our husband to be his helpmeet? So are we in this for what we can give to Elohim, that sacrificial giving, laying down our lives in the world so that we can then live to help him, to further his kingdom? Or are we perhaps just maybe just a question 
perhaps we're still in this for what we can get from Elohim. And we deceive ourselves. We think it's enough to be hearers only without works. Because without works, our faith is dead. But I mean, just as a question, brothers, you know, realizing the seriousness of the end times that we are now entering into, doesn't it kind of seem like the thing that most of Ephraim, most of us forget, is that it's going to be Yeshua who's the one who gets to pick his bride? That it's Yeshua the one who gets to do the proposing? And that while many are called, only a very few are chosen? What kind of people ought we to be if many are called and only few are chosen? If those who walk the broad, easy road are not called, it's only those righteous who are willing to suffer persecution to walk a narrow and afflicted path in Yeshua. If you were Yeshua, which one would you pick? People who took action, like the Apostle Shaul, like Timothy, or someone else? Yeah, but, you know, he's got a lot of potential candidates for his bride. You know, so the thing is, uh, we have to think like a righteous bride. If we want him to ask for our hand in marriage, then don't we need to take care to be the kind of bride that he wants? <laughs> Just think about this. You know, and if Elohim says right there he wants a consecrated bride, then don't we need to dedicate ourselves and devote ourselves and set ourselves apart for his purposes, whatever they might be? Well, you know, I don't know, but if, if I was Yeshua, would I want a slothful spouse who sits around on the couch and she's very demanding and expecting and she expects me to tend her continually? She eats my food. You know, I'm on mission from my father. My father is a war Elohim. He sent me as the Sar Shalom, the field marshal of peace, meaning there will be peace once his kingdom is established to the ends of the earth, like it says. Oh, oh, and that's our job to do that. So do we want to be one of the few who walk the narrow and afflicted path to do the things it takes to build Yeshua's kingdom? It's not easy work. It's, it's difficult work to do everything with integrity and to listen, to pray, and wait on the Spirit, to do everything in integrity. Do we want the bride who's doing anything, doing everything with integrity? Or do we want the bride who never lifts a hand to help her husband build his kingdom or his father? Who would you choose to be your forever queen, bearing in mind that marriage is forever and forever is a very long time? Well, let's bear that thought in mind as we look to our prophetic Haftarah portion in Malachi chapters 3 and 4. And what we're going to see is that Yahweh is not as pleased with his people, in this case Judah, but could just as well be Ephraim. Yahweh is not as pleased with his people as some of his people might seem to hope. And Yahweh is sending his messenger, Malachi, my messenger, he's sending his messenger to call his people, Judah, to repent and to return to him and not their own customs and traditions and ways, not their own understanding, but to ask him how he sees things. And this is just the same he's been calling us in Ephraim since the day he brought all of us out of Egypt. You know, we were first to go. Judah, at least, is still wandering with Elohim. But knowing us... <laughs> You know, you, you hate to be the one to have to say this kind of thing, brothers, but is it possible that we're going to have some Ephraimite wonder brides out there who are going to ask, well, what do you mean? In what way do we need to return to Yahweh? We're wonderful brides. We, we confess with our lips that Yeshua is Elohim. Now, we've not done any works, but what do you mean return to him? We don't tithe, but what do you mean return to him? So here we have Yahweh answering these questions. Uh, so as we read, let's just imagine this is Yahweh. So we've come out of Egypt, right? So here we are. Our forefathers took an oath, a wedding vow to love, honor, and cherish Yahweh our Elohim, in this case Yeshua, Yahweh Yeshua, 
for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, to obey everything he says to do. And he'll lead us by the hand and take us up in glory. We just have to do what he says. Brothers, sisters, are we? And if not, then how are we his consecrated bride? How are we keeping his Torah if we're not keeping ourselves pure in his sight? So in Christian thought, the prophecies are thought to be more or less linear. Sort of you can check, check, check. Once something is checked off, it's fulfilled. And there is some truth in that. However, in Hebraic thought, the prophecies are thought to be cyclical, meaning that they can recur repeatedly and you can have greater fulfillments and lesser fulfillments. And there is some truth in that also. Yahweh is working things toward an end and he uses certain patterns and cycles in order to fulfill that kind of thing. But here, Malachi speaks of a dual prophecy concerning the first coming of Yeshua as Messiah, as well as his latter return. And we see that Malachi chapters 3 and 4 speak of the day when Yahweh will judge between those who have been obedient to him and those who have not been so much obedient to him. All you have to be is lukewarm. Just bear that thought in mind. Well, in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 5, well, this is specifically for Judah. However, it could just as well be for Ephraim. But Yahweh includes a specific warning for Judah against those who exploit widows and orphans rather than taking care of widows and orphans. And some people feel this has a lot to do with the end time events as they're playing out right now. Okay, so someone might say, uh, well, what about uh, capitalism? It's okay, I get it. I understand capitalism is a part of Israel's economic structure. Uh, but to suggest that you don't have to take care of your fellow Israelites, that's what Yahweh is addressing here. Uh, so in Israel, it's supposed to be that all Israelites are to look out for each other. We see several examples of that in the Torah. We see more. Uh, so, but every Israelite is supposed to be there for every other Israelite. And, uh, you know, I get it. Uh, in the case of Israel, we're not related until we go back to Israel. When we go back to Israel, we're related. And other than that, people who are outside of the nation of Israel, I get it. We're not related unless you go all the way back to Noah or Noah. But one of the very first messages of Scripture, all the way back in the Garden of Eden, is that, yes, we are our brother's keepers. It was Cain or Cain who questioned what? I have to be my brother's keeper? The answer to that question is a resounding yes. So the way it's supposed to be in the sect of the Nazarenes is that we accept anyone. We don't care. All we want to see is a witness of Yeshua's Spirit operating in you. We want to see you walking in the Spirit. We want to see you obeying what Yahweh says to do, which means hearing His voice, and as a minimum, obeying the commandments that are written. Uh, So, (laughs) above all else, we need to be led in all things by Yeshua's Spirit, and there's a witness of that. That's what we need to see, is that, that witness. In the case of a nation, I understand capitalist market principles, you know, but we all, we all need to work hard. Everyone needs to work hard, do their best every day, as if working for Yahweh. But here in Malachi, Yahweh is addressing a specific situation with the southern kingdom where those with land and money are basically behaving like what would have been called some evil black horse capitalist imperialist running pig dog. Uh, instead of instead of behaving like spirit-filled Israelites who love Yahweh their Elohim and who then love their neighbors as themselves. So the specific situation Yahweh is addressing here is the people with power, the people with land, and the people with money are not caring about their workers, They're just using them and losing them. Well, so what's Yahweh talking about? To whom is Yahweh speaking here? To whom is he addressing this message? Well, if you're an employer, especially the southern kingdom, 
don't you need to take care of your employees just by virtue of the fact that they're Israelites? And don't you need to kind of steward them in the right direction? They didn't think so in Malachi's day. So we understand everyone needs to work. Everyone in the nation needs to do their best. But if they're truly working for you and they're doing their best to be obedient to Yahweh, then don't we all owe each other as brothers and sisters? Don't we owe each other just a little bit more than a paycheck and a good swift kick out the door? In Scripture, if you are someone's employer, then you have a responsibility to require your employees also to live righteously. and That's not easy to do in this fallen world. But let's ask ourselves the question. This is the question in Malachi. What happens in society when we don't care about our own poor and needy inside of Israel? What happens if we basically use and lose or throw out the poor and, ne and needy of Israel? Is that of Elohim? Is that Yahweh's spirit in us? And if we're truly in Elohim's will, how can we not care about the poor of Israel, at least within the Nazarene sect? So how much, if the greatest command is to love Yahweh with all we have, and then the second commandment, which is the tricky one, is to love our neighbors as ourselves, then how much love is it showing our brothers and sisters in the Nazarene sect when we ignore the poor and the needy of Yeshua's body? If we're not providing for the poor and the needy, aren't we robbing Yahweh of his tithes? If we're not giving third tithe, how are we loving our brothers and sisters who are poor? Do we behave like one big spiritual family that's united by our burning desire to hasten to do everything Yahweh says to do? Do we discipline ourselves to do everything that he says? Yeah, I had to have a self-confrontation with myself years ago and realize, no. And every so often, we need to take account, take a fresh, sit down and count the cost all over again. But the commitment is that he's taking us from slavery in Egypt and cleaning us up and making us into a queen fit for his son. So do we think that's easy? And if not, do we truly discipline ourselves to hasten to do everything that he says, including taking care of our own poor? Now, we're not talking about taking care of the world's poor here. That's not, we're not trying to take care of any other group's poor. That won't get solved until after we're in power, after Armageddon. Once we have Yeshua's rod of iron, all that will change. Okay, but what we're talking about here is taking care of our own poor inside of Nazarene Israel. Uh, so uh, let's ask it again. Uh, do we truly love our neighbor as ourselves? Do we truly behave like one big spiritual family that is truly unified, united by our burning desire to do everything Yeshua says to do? Remembering that Yeshua was the one who gave us the commandments. So, And then, if we know that, do we then discipline ourselves to do everything that he says so as to run our very best race? Or not so much. The running shoes are getting a good rest. Brothers, do we behave like the consecrated bridal nation that Yahweh always said that he wanted? and that our forefathers promised that we would become. Are we doing that or not really, not yet? In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 5, Yahweh says he will bring judgment, and we know what judgment looks like, especially as we're entering into these end times, we can begin to see what kinds of judgments are coming. And Yahweh also says he will be a swift witness against all those who exploit their workers. Well, hello, uh, we're talking to the Sabbatean of Frankist sect. Uh, there's certain people who own the world effectively, and many of them have power and control and strings through the Sabbatean of Frankist sect. Uh, these are the people who are in control of the planet effectively, and they do not help the widows and orphans, but instead they exploit 
them. So we have to talk about two-house theory, except the thing is the rabbis already know who we are. Uh, <laughs> that was the big surprise to me in 2017 was to learn they have known who we are since the days of King Solomon. They have been tracking our movements for a very long time, many, many years. So, but basically in the Sabbatean Franca system, it's the same thing as the Egyptian system or the Babylonian system. It's the rule of the elites by the elites for the elites. So in other words, they're going to exploit anyone who is without power. And Yahweh says he's going to bring judgment and that he himself will be a swift witness against them. Now, you can claim ignorance of two-house theory, except the rabbis know all about it. They've been tracking us since the days of King Rehoboam. So if Yahweh says he is going to be the one to bring judgment and a swift witness, how are you going to escape that? Well, <laughs> you know, you're not taking care of your brothers and sisters in the nation of Israel. Right? And the reason why is you're seeking to gain advantage over your brothers and sisters in Israel, just like the Babylonian, just like the Egyptian top-down pyramidal elites. And the thing is, that's all it really takes to make Yahweh really angry, is to treat those who are in his family like they're not part of your family. That's what he's addressing, the situation here in Malachi. He's saying, you're not treating them like your kin. They're not, you're not treating them like your brethren. And you're going to have swift witness and judgment for it. Ow. Major bad. Major penalty box. Better get that one fixed quick. Hear the rod. The rod is coming. There's a lot of people who think they're going to escape. They're not going to escape. So... What does this mean to us in Ephraim? So while Yahweh is rebuking our brothers in Judah for forsaking his ordinances, his ancestors responded with denial. They're saying, well, what are we doing wrong? You didn't make this fun. You know, we left Egypt. We thought this was going to be fun. You know, this, this business of building your son's kingdom, you're not making it any fun. So. You know, in, in what way shall we return? We didn't go anywhere. We're not doing anything. We're just resting and reading on the Sabbath, and we're taking it easy. And we're doing whatever is easy and free. But that's making a sacrifice like the Apostle Shaul, isn't it? Isn't that what Shaliak Shaul did? He just kind of sat around. Isn't that what the 12 disciples did? They just kind of sat around and just kind of shared their insights in someone's living room. They didn't try to build a kingdom or anything. No, they weren't. They weren't trying to establish a governmental structure called the Tabernacle of David. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so, brothers, speaking honestly, do we know any Ephraimite super brides who secretly feel this way? You know, Yahweh's saying, <laughs> okay, you know, you say you love me. <laughs> that sounds nice. Show me your fruit. Show me that you love me. Don't just say it. Don't just give me lip service. Show me your love for me and for your brothers and sisters. Because up until now, I only see the fruits of disobedience. You're not taking care of your poor and needy, and you've been robbing me. And yet you ask, robbing you? Robbing Elohim? How have we robbed you? Well, you have robbed me of my tithes and offering. So now my priesthood doesn't have enough to operate with. They don't have enough to do the job of building the kingdom globally. And your whole nation is cursed because why? Because you have robbed me. And you don't care about the sacrificial retraining system that I gave you after you hoard away after the golden calf. You don't even understand what the Levitical sacrificial system is about. And yet when I send my messengers, the prophets, when I try to tell you, still you deny your sins. And you say, what are we doing wrong? Did we do something wrong here? We're just living our lives. We're just enjoying the blessings of you being our Elohim. We don't actually like have to pay our tithes or, or owe you or anything. I mean, you sprung us from Egypt. That's great. 
we have a great dinner every year. We celebrate you. But hear your voice. What? And obey it? What? Wait, that's a strange thing. Now he says, you're not listening for my voice. You're not being diligent to do all that I say to you, including all of my written commandments. And still you ask, uh, what's wrong? What are we doing wrong? We're doing something wrong here? <sighs> you can just imagine how Yahweh feels at this whole thing. You know, this is Yahweh's talking to Judah here, but this could easily be addressed to us in Ephraim. Now, check this out. In the United States alone, there are an estimated 247 million people who in some form or another profess a Christian faith. I'm hearing this statistic. I'm like, are you kidding me? Where is the fruit? Oh, oh, can we guess how many of those 247 million super brides tithe? Totals less than 1%. We get more fat in our milk than Yeshua's people support his kingdom work. Hmm, yes. Sounds like a set-apart Proverbs 31 bride who wants nothing more than to lay down her life in the world and now to live for him, to build his kingdom, that the, his father sent him to build a kingdom. He wants our help as his help meet to help him build his kingdom. This the first, so we're, me? What? So we start running our best race. <laughs> Sounds like that, right? Does it not? Ouch. No, I guess it doesn't. <sighs> Brothers, can we imagine how Yahweh feels in this whole scenario? Can we imagine Yahweh's thoughts? You know, Ephraim, Judah, you say you love me. Really? You don't support my work. You don't support those who are doing my work. You don't help the poor, even inside our own nation. You don't help the poor, the widow, or the orphan. But rather, you look down on the poor and the widow and the orphan. You say, well, it's their problem. They just have to work hard or do better. You're not helping my son build the kingdom that I myself sent him to build for me. And yet you say you love me? Really? How much does the average Ephraimite or Jew in dispersion spend on his or her pets? How much they spend on their dog? How much they spend on their cat? How much they spend on their car? How much they spend on their vacation plans? My people are giving their dogs more attention and love and treats than they give me. And then they have money for vacations, money. I've seen people with money for, for airplanes. They don't have money for Yahweh. I've seen people with money for to buy fancy sewing machines, they don't have money for Yahweh. People who have airplanes, they don't have money for Yahweh. People who have money for horses, they don't have any money for Yahweh. Yahweh says, they rob me of my tithes and offerings. They're sitting around waiting for my blessings. Do we know anyone like this? They're sitting around waiting for my blessings and they're not serving me. They're lazy servants. Even dogs show more love for their masters than my people show me. Verse 14, Yahweh says to Judah, you have said it is useless to serve Elohim. How did we profit from keeping his ordinances? What did we get out of it? What does building Yeshua's kingdom do for us? Not you, no. Us, us, us. Hello, Yahweh. Mic check. You hear me? What does it benefit us? What profit do we get from being tested and refined and walking like we're in mourning, walking like we're in repentance before Yahweh of hosts? <laughs> you know, you, you say you're going to give us the blessings, but the way the world is, it's the ones who behave proudly are the ones who get blessed. You say the meek shall inherit the earth, but, you know, in this fallen world, it's like, doesn't it kind of seem like those who do wickedness are the ones that get raised up? 
They even tempt Elohim and they go free. But you won't bless us if we do evil. What's with that? What's your problem, Yahweh? Who do you think you are? Okay, how about some equal weights and measures here? Okay, if the evil ones can do evil and they can get blessed, then shouldn't we be able to do evil and get blessed also? What are you thinking, Yahweh? He says, but you say, why should we love Yahweh for better or for worse? Why should we do our best to be a chaste, set-apart virgin bride unto him? Yahweh he says, why do you say, well, all these harlots go around and they don't get punished. Why should we have to be a faithful bride? They're messed up. Why do we have to be right? Why should we have to abstain from the lusts of our eyes and the lusts of our flesh and our pride? That's the one that will get you. Why should we have to abstain from our worldly lusts and not them? We're the ones trying to obey you. We're the ones having to walk humbly like we're in mourning. Why are those the ones getting the blessings? Brothers, sisters, do we know anyone in Ephraim like that, maybe? I mean, does that sound like a bride who loves her husband? She's doing her best to follow her husband and support her husband. Does that sound like a bride loving her husband for better or for worse, no matter whether you're building and working hard or no matter what? How many Christians and how many Messianics, <clears throat> how many Ephraimites do we know who seem to behave as if they seem to think that the day of Yeshua's return is going to be some kind of a party? some kind of a big celebration, and they only need to keep doing what they're already doing, which is resting and reading at someone else's house on Shabbat. And then we're just going to learn about the Torah. We're going to be hearers only and not doers. And we're just going to wait for the rapture bus. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what do some people think? I, you know, I don't know anyone who would say those exact words, but it's like the way people behave. What, what do we speak through Yahweh, through our actions, because that's what Yahweh judges as our fruit. Do we show good fruit, or do we show no fruit, or do we show bad fruit? Well, <laughs> Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1 says that the day of Yahweh will come burning like an oven. Take a look at the end times, take a look at the news. It means there's going to be a lot of fire and heat and smoke. He says, and all the proud who do wickedly will be burnt up. So they might think, the Sabbatean Francus might think that things are going to go their way. But Yahweh says, no, it's not going to go their way. So we're talking about the Masons, the Illuminati, the Sabbatean Francus, those who are doing things in secret. Right? So I mean, a lot has been said recently in the news about how the Georgia Guidestones were destroyed and how the Georgia Guidestones speak of getting ready to wipe out 95% of the Earth's population and enslave the rest. Yahweh says they won't win. So, you know, this, we know that the rabbis are monitoring our communications. We know that uh, from the past. And, uh, you know, brothers, what Yahweh always wanted was that we hear his voice and obey it and obey everything that was written down. So uh, it's going to be terrible, these end times, for all but the true assembly of Philadelphia, who's already disciplining themselves, learning to love their brothers in truth. Uh, so we don't need to be disciplined. We've learned to discipline ourselves. Now we're talking about both World Wars three and four unfolding in this scenario. I'm explaining Revelation in the end times, or Revelation Simplified, Father willing, someday we'd like to do Revelation Part 2. Uh, but <clears throat> Matthew 24, everything in the tribulation, that's all coming right up, courtesy of the Sabbatean Frankist sect. Uh, and they, of course, in turn, are ultimately everyone works for the papacy. But Yahweh is allowing these things because we are not doing what he said. And that's it. That's, that's the whole deal. We're in slavery in Egypt. Yahweh is willing to take us as we are, but he loves us too much to allow us to stay that way. 
because he knows his standards for a bride for his son are way up here at perfection, way up high. And he just asks us to do what he says to do, and he'll, he'll lead us to it. But here's the difference we've been mentioning again. So here in verse 4, Yahweh tells us that if we want to be protected and in his favor in the judgment, then we should remember to keep all his statutes and his judgments that are contained in the Torah of Moshe. In other words, Ephraim, (laughs) I love you, but your problems are because you are still not diligently studying the marriage contract and you're not taking 100% of everything that I said to heart. I can only work with you if you're willing to work with me. I can only work with you if you're willing to discipline yourself. Well, you know, let's consider that Yahweh is basically talking about Matthew chapter 24 here. Malachi, Matthew chapter 24, same, you know, that's what he's talking about. So we're talking about the tribulation time frame, and we are heading into the tribulation time frame now. If you doubt that, go to the Revelation News and the Nazareth website. Uh, But however, Yahweh did deliver this to Judah, but it's also very much applicable to us. So if we know that the day of Yahweh is coming, how well are we preparing for that day? Well, we know there's some important lessons and principles to be found in the sequences of things in Scripture. Not just in Scripture, but in the sequences which things are presented in. So, in that matter, let's consider the context. Matthew 24 talks about the same things as Malachi. Then Matthew chapter 25 is effectively broken down into three parables. and Each parable shows us what type of bride Yeshua wants. In other words, this is the way to be, and this is not the way to be, because he also shows us what he does not want in a bride. So the first parable is that of the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins. They're all virgins, but five are wise and five are foolish. Now, the five wise virgins diligently prepared for their bridegroom's return. They're all ready for the bridegroom's return. Okay, so as we show in our studies on Revelation in the End Times and also Revelation Simplified on YouTube, we explain that this takes place at Armageddon. Okay, after the tribulation, then comes Armageddon. That's when Yeshua is coming for us. Okay, but let's notice we've got five wise virgins. And they had lamps that remained lit and never went out, even though Yeshua was delayed in his coming. They maintained their lamps so their lamps could burn continuously for him, even if something went wrong. They were prepared. They made the coming of their bridegroom be ready for their wedding. That was their top priority in life. So they could be prepared to do their role, to take their job as his help me, as truly one flesh. The wise brides took care to prepare their wedding dresses. They laid up extra supplies of oil, uh, spare wicks. So they were ready and prepared for his coming, even though the bridegroom was delayed. So this means they were the type of brides to think ahead and prepare. So if we want to be his bride, we also need to take a look at the times we're in. Think ahead and prepare. Well, the foolish virgins, they didn't seem to think the bridegroom's coming was really worth being prepared for. They had more important things to do with their time. So when the bridegroom was delayed, their candles and their wicks went out. They didn't plan on contingencies. They didn't plan ahead. The foolish virgins just assumed that the bridegroom would wait for them to get ready. Well, they just had all summer to prepare. They got engaged at Shavuot or Pentecost. Now we're talking the, the, the feast of the seventh month. They just had all summer to prepare. Oh, but she didn't. Oh, and Yeshua didn't wait for her either. So Yeshua took with him 
those faithful virgins who'd put preparing for the wedding first. Those are the brides who had consecrated themselves and set themselves apart for him and made him their top priority in life. Those were the brides who were completely focused on him. He increased. They decreased. Those were the ones he took. The others were left behind. They lost out permanently. Well, then next is the parable of the talents. And the parable of the talents is very similar to the parable of the minas. Remember, this is after Matthew 24. Yeshua is talking about the kind of bride he wants to come for. Why are we going through all this? Well, he's coming for this kind of a bride and not for that kind of a bride. So Yeshua tells us about the master who delivered his goods to his servants with the expectation that they would be busy about his work while he was gone. That's what you did as a good servant back in Scripture times, so to speak. You were busy about your master's work, trying to do your best for him, trying to make things better for him while he was gone. Well, then the master returned to settle accounts and to see what have they done for him while he was gone. Did they follow his instructions? Were they wise for him? Did they attempt to increase his holdings? Or did they do their own thing? Did they get drunk? Did they not work hard? Well, those servants who had worked hard and made a profit for their master, they received praise and rewards for their dedication and faithfulness. He said to them, Well done, good and faithful servant. But the servant who had done wickedly, and he did not labor for his master while his master was away. He was found to be a wicked, lazy, slothful servant, and he was cast into the outer darkness because the master found that servant unprofitable. That's all we need to be is unprofitable in the sense that we're not helping to build Yeshua's unified global kingdom. We're not obeying everything that's written in Scripture, in the Torah, in our bridal covenant. Well, if we're not helping Yeshua to set up the unified global kingdom that his father sent him to train us to set up, Yeshua is telling us, you're not about my business. That's going to get you cast into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That doesn't require us to do anything bad. That just requires, all we have to do for that is just be lukewarm. Just think we are super bride or bride of the millennium. And that's it. We don't have to work. We don't have to worry. We're just resting and reading over at someone else's house. Whatever's cheap, whatever's easy, whatever's free. (laughs) Yeshua says that's all it takes to commit suicide, spiritually speaking. Okay, do we get that? Is that something we understand? What part of that is to commit suicide, spiritually speaking? is to be lukewarm. Well, lastly, Yeshua tells us the parable of the final judgment. Yeshua says he will come in his glory and he will sit on the throne of his glory. And in that day, all will be gathered before him for his judgment. It's Yeshua who's going to judge us. Like we saw before, Yahweh would send his messenger Malachi, he would send his, my messenger, which was Yeshua. So Yeshua is the one that gave us all of these commandments. And Yeshua is the one we're supposed to be building this kingdom for. So everyone's going to be gathered upon the king's return, upon the master's return. And those who labored for him and did righteously, and they worked for him because they loved him, and they also loved their brothers and sisters. And they cared for those who were poor and were sick or in need, especially those inside the body. Those are the ones, Yeshua says, they will be the ones to receive eternal life. He says, but those who hated their brothers and sisters and who did not care for the poor, they did not care for the sick or the needy of Nazarene Israel, of the sect of Nazarene. 
they will be cast out into everlasting punishment. What part of cast out into everlasting punishment do we not understand? So Yom Teruah is coming shortly, and that is traditionally when the bridegroom sends his messenger, Malachi, my messenger, but the bridegroom sends his messenger ahead to announce the bridegroom's soon coming arrival, blowing the shofar on Yom Teruah. And that is when the master will return. Then he will come later, and he will decide if we are faithful, dedicated brides, or if we are not. And so Shaliach Shaul says, we are to prepare ourselves to be his chaste virgin bride. So since that's what Yeshua is coming for, since he wants us to be the chaste virgin bride, and that's all he wants, let's be honest with ourselves, brethren. After hearing about the two different types of virgins, which one represents us the most? Let's be straight with ourselves. Are we the wise virgins who truly love Yeshua with all their heart, all their soul, and all their strength? Are we one of the wise virgins who work diligently to prepare for the coming wedding, to make sure we have oil and wicks, the dresses without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish? We'll talk more about the function of garments at another time. But we we clothe ourselves with a garment of righteousness or a garment of praise. Our, our, our garment has to be spotless, without wrinkle, without blemish. A bride is to consecrate herself for her husband. Are we, brethren, are we consecrating every aspect of our lives to Yeshua as our head? And are we forsaking our former lives in the world, in Egypt, in Babylon, in mystery Babylon? And are we abstaining from worldly lusts as his chaste, faithful, set-apart bride? Are we trying to become the kind of bride that he wants to come for? Or are we just assuming that because we're called, we're chosen? Brothers, sisters, many are called. We need to make sure we are one of the ones that is chosen. You know, are we perhaps one of the types of virgins that expects a marriage of convenience? We expect it to be easy to build Yeshua's kingdom. We expect it to be easy, comfortable for us to build Yeshua's kingdom. Or perhaps are we turning our heads back and longing for Sodom and Gomorrah? Or perhaps turning back and longing for Egypt? We like our forefathers who, who wanted to go back to Egypt. Sure, they wanted to leave Egypt and build Yahweh's kingdom. Oh, but then they found out it took work. So this is why Yahweh brings us into these trials, brothers, sisters. He wants to know where are our hearts. That's why we have trials. Do we rejoice in the trials? Because our heart is in Yahweh and we know he's bringing us something we need to be refined in? Or are our hearts in the world? Are we missing our former lives and just going to the beach, not doing anything for him? We're living our lives in the world, <clears throat> not laying down our lives in the world. We're still camping in our free time. We're still playing poker or pinochle. You know, Yahweh will not be mocked. And Elohim does not show partiality in judgment. Either we purify ourselves, we make ourselves so spiritually appealing to Yeshua that he wants to come take us as his bride because we've been working to build his kingdom. Either we make that decision from his point of view, either we make that decision or we don't. There is no in-between. It's our choice. Brothers, sisters, we are faced with the choice of allegiance. Do we pledge allegiance to a flag? Do we pledge allegiance to a Babylonian system? Do we pledge allegiance to what is essentially Egypt or the world? Are we, are we sad because we can't live our lives in the world? Or are we ecstatic because we were sprung from prison, from jail, from slavery in Egypt? He's taking us step by step and walking us each step of the way 
so he can later take us up in glory. We have to be tested. It's our choice. Brothers and sisters, we hope and pray that this message will help reach some hopeful brides-to-be in Ephraim and those of Judah who are sojourning with us. For just like Shaliach Shaul, we are jealous for you with a righteous jealousy. We have all been betrothed to one husband, even Yeshua Messiah, the son of the living Elohim. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us all do our all and give our all to present ourselves approved unto him in every way. Let's become the brides that he's coming for. It takes work. You can't just keep Torah on accident. May he lead us all to purify ourselves, to become chaste virgins, so we might become worthy of the Son of the living Elohim. Shabbat Shalom.